Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Reflections and Dreams, a 5.30 p.m. poetry panel with three terrific poets. We have Evelyn Lau, Chris Banks, and Leanne Boschman. Um, so I want to remind people, although you probably already know by the end of this day, that there's uh, books to purchase uh, at Iron Dog Books. Um, and uh, you can also find out more information about the festival online, which is almost over, and the silent auction, which is almost over. We want to acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And uh, we want to thank our generous donors and sponsors, including SFU and the Writer's Studio for this wonderful space and their continued support of Word Vancouver. There's, of course, the Canada Arts Council, the Canada Book Fund, the Canada Heritage Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, Creative BC, the City of Vancouver, the Downtown Business um, of Vancouver Association, the Yosef Wask Family Foundation, the Hamber Foundation, the BC and Yukon Book Prizes, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, Quill, Pace and Associates, the Crime Writers Association, the Federation of BC Writers, the Surrey Library, the Vancouver Public Library, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, and many more that I will not mention. <laughs> so for a full list of our partners, you can visit the website. And without all these terrific sponsors, this free festival could not happen. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna have two sets uh, of the poets reading a bit of discussion um, in between the two sets and then another discussion and ho hopefully a chance for some questions. I'm gonna introduce them one at a time so you don't have me yakking at you and um, uh, constantly because we're here for the poets. So first I'll introduce Evelyn Lau. Evelyn Lau is a lifelong Vancouverite who has published 13 books, including now nine volumes of poetry. Uh, from 2011 to 2014, she was Vancouver's Poet Laureate. Her 220, uh, 2020 collection was Pineapple Express with Anvil Press, uh, and this one, Cactus Gardens, is just woo, burning. It's hot off the presses uh, and just arrived in my hands yesterday, and I think it arrived in your hands today. Faster. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You got a chance to bond with it before I did. Yes. My baby. Yes. <laughs> um, Thank you, Fiona. Yeah, it feels I brought the manuscript to read from because there was no guarantee the book was actually going to be out. So um, I'm still, I, I can't wait to just go away and, and hide away with, with the actual physical book. So thank you, everybody, for staying till the bitter end here, coming to our reading. Um, I'm going to read. So we're going to do a few short readings interrupted by some conversation and then, uh, and then a few short readings again. So I'll start with the first poem in the collection, which is uh, very much a Vancouver poem. It's called Summer Solstice. This late in our lives, we know to be grateful for another season, lunch on Graham's terrace, mare's tails flaring across the sky. We're so lucky, April says, and maybe for a moment I honestly feel it. Potted palms, purple mountain range, pleasure boats in the distant harbor. Trump Tower, a block of glass obscuring the view. We're losing it all to land assemblies and foreign investment. These retro buildings with their brass elevators and parquet floors demolished to make way for another twisted tower. Soon it'll be gone, Shirley says, gesturing at the sweep of low and mid-rises, the city as we know it. We've worked lifetimes for a piece of this peninsula, and now we're balanced on the bubble, wobbly with vertigo. A hummingbird flashes emerald at the feeder, seasonal fruits heaped like citrines and garnets in a silver bowl, skewers of chicken and charred peppers, pasta studded with nuggets of bacon. I sip another spoonful of Alan's almond gazpacho, gazpacho, thick as a dish of clotted cream. When we remember the people squatting in refugee camps, sinking in rafts on open ocean, of course we're blessed. It's grotesque. Barring a renoviction, Graham will entertain for years on this rooftop, pouring wine and lemon water, steering his guests from sun to shade to sun again under changing skies. 
The second poem I'm going to read is um, in memory of a student of ours, Colleen Bryant. I don't know if you knew Colleen, if she was in one of our classes. At a, but she was a fixture here at SFU. And this is called Hospice. I ended up reading it at her uh, memorial service. In the last days, your eyes kept drifting over my shoulder, tugged to the painting on the wall. Ocean, pebbled beach, eagles and gulls. Washed in coastal light, you drank salt spray into your pores, listened to the call and response of the waves as your gaze focused, unfocused, your throat too parched to speak above a whisper. Force of will isn't working, you said with a wry grin, but it still flared in the vivid jewels of your eyes your hand gesturing for mine, how you ascended the mountain of pillows to greet me. This was close to spring, March, a month whose end you might not see. A commotion beneath the arbor along the stone path, robins in the grass, songbirds rioting in the trees. The blue-gray of the hospice trimmed in white like a seaside resort tucked out of sight, so that I circled the block over and over, searching for you, cursing, almost crying as rain thudded from the sky as it had all winter, as if it wanted to pound us flat. I had never known how to carry the parcel of even an ordinary sadness. How I wanted to stay with you as you slid in and out of sleep, pale lips parting, damp sugar smell rising from your body. You were pulling further away, but still here, almost weightless, mortal, almost holy. Thank you. Beautiful poems. Thank you, Evelyn. What I, I love about Evelyn's poems is they're multi-sensory. Um, there's taste, there's smell, there's texture. Um, beautiful uh, depiction of place. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Next, we have Chris Banks, who's here virtually. Uh, Chris Banks is a Canadian poet and author of six collections of poetry, most recently, Deep Fake Serenade, with this very striking cover, uh, which is out with Nightwood Editions. His first full-length collection, Bonfires, was awarded the Jack Chalmers Award for Poetry by the Canadian Authors Association in 2004. Bonfires was also a finalist for the Gerald Lampert Award for Best First Book of Poetry in Canada. His poetry has appeared in multiple prestigious magazines, such as the New Quarterly, ARC Magazine, The Antigonish Review, Avant, Malahat Review, Griffel, American Poetry Journal, Prism International, among others. He lives and writes in Kitchener. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Yes, I'm coming to you live from Kitchener, Ontario, where it's just... Uh, the sun has gone down, and I'm sitting here at my uh, dining room table. I'm going to read you two poems from uh, Deep Fake Serenade. So this first poem is called Show and Tell. I have this birthmark on my forearm, a copy of Lorca's Gisela of the Dark Death on my office door. I share 22 pairs of chromosomes with my favorite poets making us family. My soul feels snagged on my insides like an empty plastic bag caught on a branch in winter. Here is my white flag surrendering my position. All the heads on Easter Island have bodies buried beneath the ground. The moon has moonquakes. My body emits light, but not enough to stumble a path without a torch at night. Even pigeons can tell the difference between a Monet and a Picasso, so what is your excuse? Outer space, Smells like seared steak. Show and tell felt more fun in grade school. Yet here I am standing at the front of the classroom saying I have enough iron in my blood to produce a nail three inches long. Koalas have fingerprints. Saturn and Jupiter rain diamonds. Here is a letter I wrote to Jacques Cousteau when I was young. Here is a dissection tray full of failed relationships. Despite me not being a scientist, here is my laboratory where I mix cardiac tremors with a field of sunflowers recording the results. Maybe I'm doing this all wrong because the dog I brought to class on a leash is a wolf. 
This map of stars I unfurled is really only target paper peppered with BB gun pellets. Think of these broken guitar strings and worn lacy garters as my declaration of interdependence. When people ask you to show them who you really are, tell them about your yellow pages of found objects, your penchant for strange facts, how crows hold grudges, how sharks existed before trees, how there's a jellyfish that is immortal. And maybe they'll put a little gold star, a little token, a little ballyhoo beside your name. And the second poem is called Ink Blots. I have measured out my life in K cups. Please add snow shoveling, foreign wars, daddy long legs, vowels to the list. Rain fell yesterday like a ritual. My children are scared of thunderstorms. A golden retriever is missing, says a flyer stapled to a hydro pole. God is lost. Life feels unscripted. I say rivers, fauna, skyscraper, expecting my hands, my mind to gift wrap it all into meaning. My language is tired of looking for a common denominator. Behind every word, the sound of a hinge opening. Be behind things entering my eyes, a bridge to understanding. Press an ear to my chest to hear a hive of contradictions. Honey is the essence of wildflowers. Blood is the essence of life owed to a massive star at the center of our galaxy. I remember this despite failing astrology class, despite passing a lie detector. The ink plots prove I'm a good person. Radio telescopes probe the universe for mysterious chatter, like these sentences full of fundraisers and floodwaters, love and work retirements, quasars and champagne. The art of living is seeing each other beyond addictions and condos. I've waited my whole life to emanate a brightness, to wear a halo of knowing. Outside phenomena and inside impulses collide when the sparks flying. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. Two wonderful examples of the poems in his book, uh, Deep Fake Serenade. And all of the poems, um, and we'll be hearing more in the second set, bring together all these disparate elements. They unify them through the poem. And there's humor, and there's all kinds of illusions. They're, they're just delightful. Thanks so much for, for that, Chris. So our third poet, is Leanne Boschman, a Vancouver Island-based writer living and working on the traditional territories of the Cowichan tribes and the Malahat Nation. Her poetry has been published in Geist Magazine, Prism, Other Voices, Dandelion Magazine, Room, Arc, Grain, as well as others. Her poems have been published in several anthologies. Her first collection, Precipitous Signs, a rain journal, was published by Leaf Press in 2009 and explored colonial narratives of settlement and the lived experience of women in labor markets and domestic settings. Leanne completed her PhD in Languages, Cultures, and Literacies uh, program at SFU and has collaborated as a curriculum developer and educator in several BC communities. She presently works with adult learners in the Pachidot First Nation for Vancouver Island University. Leanne's second beautiful collection of poems is entitled Here at the Crux, published by Silver Bow Publishing, and it's also a recent uh, emergence uh, just out a few weeks ago. Thank you. I just want to say how honored I am to be part of this reading and that I'm also one of those very fortunate students of Fiona and Evelyn's here at SFU. And, and some of the poems in this collection were started in their, their classes. So yeah, it's really a, a special connection for me. This first poem that I'm going to read is from the first section of, of this collection that, that contains um, family stories. In this particular case, one of my grandmother that, that really resonated, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the war in Ukraine and, and uh, thinking about not just the, the physical damage and, and injuries and death and so on, but those invisible ones that, that are intergenerational. So this is called Hymns for Sad Ballads. 
On weekend mornings, Grandma Neufeld, still in her mauve quilted house coat, got agitated, made us turn off Saturday morning cartoons. I can't recall now if it was Coyote or Roadrunner who opened boxes labeled TNT, ignited countless bundles of red sticks. But with those loud pops and fizzles silence, she said, you kids just don't know. Explosions and gunshots aren't funny. They're what kill your neighbors. Sometimes she followed up her stories with vocabulary lessons. Bolshevik, Menshevik, Kulak, Gulag. When I told my mother about the Saturday morning stories, she shrugged. Grandma Neufeld had a right to her blue spells and tearful reminiscences. We could never quite keep their names straight, the family members, friends she never saw again after leaving her Mennonite village in Ukraine. At 21, she arrived in Canada with a husband and one-year-old daughter who weighed no more than a six-month baby. And that baby, she told us, was more like a scrawny fledgling, too weak to even cry. She stepped onto the train that delivered them at last to the stark center of a prairie winter. Sometime after that, she stopped going to church traded hymns for sad ballads. At 14, when I was planning to be a folk singer and played my guitar every morning before school, she asked me to sing Four Strong Winds. She always wiped away tears with a crumpled handkerchief when I got to the line, I'll look for you if I'm ever back this way. To this day, my eyes are still convinced they too saw her neighbor. The way she described him, lying there, a rag doll with shreds of stuffing spilling out onto grass. I sometimes picture her on that last day, promising to return, buttoning up her coat before that cold wind blew through the rest of her life. Okay. And uh, some of these poems e explore as well the um, yeah, some, some of the, the legacy, the, the literacy, uh, li uh, liter literary legacy, literacy leg legacy, I guess, as well. And this one is called um, Spelling Lessons. When I first grasped those marvelous shapes called letters conjured my name, spelled me, I took hold of the fat red pencil, traced them over and over in scrapbooks, on walls, later on the blackboard and on paper, still ripe with the scent of the spirit duplicator. Journal journals were filled with them, stories tapped out on an electric typewriter. Then poetry resided in the square plastic hulk of my first computer. Reading the poems of Emily Dickinson, I sometimes pictured her sister Lavinia finding the box beneath the bed. After the, um, after the poet was gone, her verses handwritten on stationery stitched together. Reading those verses, I too could unfold the inscrutable bundles with their script of letters and dashes scattered like footprints of small birds. I could release that certain slant of light. Later, all those hours spent in great classrooms, learning that those marks were only empty signifiers. For a time, the incantations of favorite childhood tales were muted. The slant of light splintered, but it was never put back into the box. Wonderful, Leanne. Um, what I noticed uh, in the poems that Chris and Leanne chose is uh, we talked about show and tell and then the spelling uh, lessons. Um, Chris, can you tell us about, about the influence of childhood and reference to, references to children in your poems? I guess I could. I mean, I, my first book of poems was really a, a book of narrative poems about childhood. So obviously the past in nostalgia was really important. And even now with my more sort of surreal or lightly surreal poems from uh, Deepfake Serenade, childhood always enters into um, the poems. And that's, I think, because for poets, I, Larry Levis, the American poet, said something really smart where he said, you know, childhood is is the Edenic place, it's Eden. You know, it's what we've been sort of um, 
pushed out of and we can never return. So it's the Edenic myth. And so maybe that's where that comes from. But I, yeah, I delight in uh, in adding, you know, some uh, imagery from childhood, like show and tell, you know, something as innocuous as that. I get the sense there's a reclaiming of childhood, childhood wonder um, in your poems, that, that desire to combat the sense of futility and horror and fear with wonder and beauty, um, which I think is, is quite wonderful. And with your poems, uh, Leanne, when you touch upon lessons and you know, you're being a teacher and so forth, uh, and then reflecting on these past lessons, there's a couple of poems about being a teacher and being a student. Yeah, it, it's it's true. It's it's so interesting to think about that um, uh, situation. I when I find myself being a teacher and in in wondering if I'm also as as much as I'm trying to you know share a body of language and certain skills and literacy, if I'm also constraining the students. If I'm, you know, I always have a little bit of that that agitation inside that I don't want to dispel the wonder. I don't want to make the world close in for them. I, you know, I want to do anything that's possible to expand, to, to keep the expansion and the wonder going. But so it's an interesting, I, I find it a, a bit of a dichotomy, that, that place of being a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And in all three books, there is this celebration of beauty and finding beauty even in unpleasant circumstances. And in Evelyn's book, when I saw this incredible cover, it made me think of sort of the colors of kind of Miami Vice in the 80s, you know, the pink and the teal and so forth. And there's a real uh, a hallucinatory feeling in the book of, of, I don't know, it was super real colors, heightened senses. Same with uh, yours, uh, Chris, there is that surreality as well, but could you talk about that surreal feeling in your poems? Hmm. Well, I think definitely um, that quality of paying attention mm -hmm. as a poet, right, is something deliberate. I mean, we do actually, um, you know, try to pay attention to our senses and, and include as much sensory detail as we can. So there's that element of that. But yeah, nostalgia, I mean, it's a strange thing. I mean, what, what Chris was saying about um, the Edenic world of childhood, I mean, and for a lot of, you know, people, their childhood was actually not that Edenic, right? But Updike had a quote in one of his poems about how perhaps we find our heaven at the start of life rather than at its end which is kind of an interesting thought. I mean, the thing about nostalgia is that we paint in our minds, our memories, these kind of wistful pictures of our past, even of our difficult pasts, right? Simply because they're gone, they're lost, and yet they're part of us. And so no matter how uncomfortable those pasts are, there's something in us that actually kind of halos it in a kind of golden light, right? There's the golden light, and then there's the shadows and the challenges. Um, a large part, powerful part um, of Cactus Gardens is the, the last section. And I remember reading uh, earlier versions in, in Geist magazine, and it deals with, I'll quote the back jacket here, the fallout of a disastrous relationship with a much older established writer. And that's where I guess I had the sense of this terrible hallucinatory feeling. Um, and I think I remember you talking about how it was very hard to write that poem. And there's a number of poems there. There's a, 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 a duet of abecedarians as well that refer to the past. And again, there's that heightened uh, sensory information and also an exploration of the opposite of a golden time of looking into the past. I'll read in the second section one of the poems from that um, from that part of the book. And yes, I mean it's, I mean, the painful thing about writing is putting ourselves deliberately back into those spaces that perhaps we would much rather just close the door on and move on, right? But in order to write from that place convincingly, we need to actually re-enter. Um, those emotional states. And so, yes, I mean, there is a sense of, you know, you're almost uncoupling from your current reality in order to re-enter 
where you were maybe 30 years ago, you know, in a very, very different place. And yet you're existing in this time as well too. And I think, so if there is that sort of hallucinatory state, I do remember one afternoon when I was, when I was immersed in the long poem that finishes the book where I felt like I had lost touch with reality. And that was a really, you know, um, I hadn't dropped acid or anything, so I was really worried. <laughs> I just, I basically just went to bed and pulled the covers over my head and thought, as long as I stay here, I can't hurt anybody. <laughs> and, you know, woke up a few hours later and was back to normal. But you can see why poets can kind of sometimes veer off the path of, of sanity because they are so deliberately putting themselves into this other world. Yes. And, and, and I think too, the, the emotions that come with being in that state can be just disarmingly powerful, intense, right? And, and I, as you were speaking, I thought of something that I've always appreciated that the American poet Jane Hirschfield said that a poem is like a knot. And, and you know, some of the strands are those very concrete details that allow us, like the sensory details that allow us to be in touch with that time again and that experience, they're evocative of that. But then there's one thread that's the unknown and the unknowable. And th that I think that's the strand where we, you know, we when we connect with it, we say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to understand this. I'm still striving to come to terms with it. But there's a part of it that's experience that that just is unknowable, maybe unresolvable. But but nevertheless, it's a very powerful strand. I think that. And and Chris, you delve into some painful moments uh, as well, but with, with humor. Is that how you, you in your poems cope with those painful past experiences? Well, I think perhaps. I mean, the, the poems deal with, you know, recovery from alcohol dependence and, you know, they make reference to, um, you know, time in rehab and, and other painful things, divorce or things, things of that nature. But, you, you know, I try to balance that with, with some humor and some, uh, you know, perhaps more optimism, uh, happier moments in my life uh, and just pure imaginative, you know, verb, <laughs> you know, that's really uh, what the book sort of is about it's about delight and surprise and wonder those sort of and beauty like the things you were talking about earlier but i do don't uh you know hedge away from those difficult moments if the poem i'm writing sort of requires a little bit of reality to sort of ground the poem uh uh, that's what I use. And uh, certainly uh, I've gotten very good feedback from other people. Um, you know, lots of young poets in Canada contact me and say, oh, I'm really happy you've talked about this or you talked about that. And that's always very, very, um, um, you know, charming, you know, to, to hear that, that people are reading your work and are uh, personally affected by it. Chris, I'd just like to say that I, I've been reading um, parts of your book this past week. And I think what I really, one of the things I really admired about it was um, the way that you're able to ground, you know, some emotional and sort of intellectual concept, concepts um, in the contemporary world by referencing all of these sort of contemporary things, right? You do that very skillfully. But I think it also, it just, the grounding by doing that is really, it's just intertwined and um, it gives it that sort of texture and that kind of uh, current life that I can see why um, younger poets would really respond to, to your work. Yes, it's, it's you. quite a vibrant, yes, a vibrant weaving of current events, current issues, past experiences and so forth. And there's a vibrancy there for sure. It's, it's a, a definite must read. So we should go on to our second set of reading now. Uh, we've heard a little bit uh, to whet your appetite about the last section of uh, Evelyn's uh, book. Um, and we'll hear from Evelyn and uh, then uh, Chris and Leanne again. Okay. Um, so I'll read two poems again. The first one is uh, quite short. And I think when I think about my life, I think a theme that I've always wrestled with is emotional self-control. I think that's probably been <laughs> my biggest battle in my whole life. And I had a friend who was a cop. And so we'd have like these really interesting conversations about emotional self-control. I mean, to him, I was like way out there. Um, so this poem kind of came from that. It's called Control. 
Remember the magnolia tree beneath the bridge, the first to bloom. There were days we passed each other on opposite sides of that bridge. Some mornings I searched for you like the heron in his dust overcoat, the seal nudging the surface of the shore. Chalk architecture, the blinding blank sky. From the start, I wanted to say, look at me. You thought so little of me that, of course, I craved more. My ceaseless hunger and embarrassment, a spill of emotion like sewage into water, like something private curdling the air, a cold sore, sore raw on a girl's lip, a menstrual splotch left on a public seat. Feminine, ugly, shameful, like need. If you read this, you would say, control yourself, your face gone hard as a shield. Um, and now this is from the last section of the book. This is on my weird, um, for, <laughs> my weird form of literary scholarship, <laughs> I guess, is going back and trying to make some sense still of this relationship that uh, threw me as a writer anyway, way off the path. A um, long, long time ago in my 20s, and he was in his 60s, and um, the whole thing kind of exploded. Um, so this is one of the poems from that section. It's called Burnt. There was a fire in your former home. It was on the news. On the ground floor, a Greek restaurant scorched and soaked, second and third stories engulfed. The room where you once wrote, a black mouth open to the sea. I walked past the ruins on Easter Sunday, spooning mango gelato from a waffle cone, along with the other sun seekers after a record month of rain. Children zigzagged past in a daze of pleasure. Old women shuffled in glittering saris. Tourists held up cell phones to the mile-long train, carting its load of coal. You brought me here once, in my youth, where nothing impressed me. The buildings on the beach too faded to charm, paint flaking, balconies rusting from salt air. I liked shiny and new, black leather, smoked glass. It was the 90s. Grimaced as you crept up the side stairs, hand on rail, your careful old man's gait, rousing my disgust. You wanted to share this relic of your former life, the lair, where you'd written your famous books. It was your ex-wife's by then, of course. It still smells like home, you said, when you unlocked the door. I wandered through modest rooms strewn with pillows, sticky with your past. Every surface scarred with sand, the air moist and personal, clogged with intimate history. Your desk at the window overlooked the beach, Look at the wonderful view, you said, but it was a gray day, the tide far out on a stretch of wet beach where a few forlorn seabirds staggered. All of it was dumpy. I couldn't wait to leave. Now it was burnt up like so much else, and I was walking past in my middle age, partner at my side. I looked up at your room and then away, as if from the scene of an accident. Blown out windows gaped open, blasted and gone. He and I walked along the pier, the warmth of the sun crowding our faces, our exposed necks. Later, we would go for fish tacos and laugh at how he tried not to notice the teenage waitress, blonde and blue-eyed, still baby-faced. I love you, the way you depict place and time, and we just go with you, um, travel through time, past into the present. Wonderful. Chris? Okay, I'm going to read two poems from Deep Fake Serenade. Uh, the first poem is about childhood again, or it seems to creep into it, so it's called No Soliciting. I can't remember the combination lock to civilization. I should climb more trees, fly more kites to stay closer to my inner child. 
My inner child eats all the cookies, quietly points to a no soliciting sign when I come calling. In the 70s, I wore flare jeans, rode a banana seat blue bicycle. It was easier to be astonished as a child. You were more aware of your heartbeat, clouds catalyzing into fantastic shapes, your inability to fly. The road looked the same forward as it did backward. Adulthood is carrying a bag of darkness over a shoulder. Sometimes you stick a hand in it. You pull out a summer spent landscaping a golf course, a wedding photo, a five week stint in rehab for a drinking problem. My inner child circling around me on his blue bicycle says, what's for dinner? I tell him my knees feel the weather more and more, that death is coming up the aisle with her beverage cart and the plane will eventually go down in flames. He smiles, revving the little plastic motor sound attached to his handlebars. He tries to do a wheelie before disappearing forever, which reminds me I still cannot fly, no matter how much I wave my arms, attached as I am to gravity's anvil, to the past's dead weight, to the knowledge every little thing won't let me go. And one more, this one's called Optimism. Maybe my favorite poem from, from the new book. Some days you forget despair's tractor pull long enough to see some little boy go vroom vroom with a toy car. Joy is invisible everywhere, like microplastics in drinking water. Sure, children are in concentration camps. The rivers are polluted. A work colleague gets some horrible disease. But joy's rumble is felt beneath what is rotten. Why is there no God of optimism? Ancient rites of happiness, that we are mostly quarks and water, but still feel joy is a bona fide miracle. Blood, hymns, and sunshine. Joy plunges its little dagger of shivers over and over into our hearts. Joy is the surprise after the surprise after apocalyptic narratives. I'm for joy getting its own Nobel Prize. Buy the stilettos, the travertine countertops if it makes you happy, the antique desks and DJ equipment while there's still time. Look, I built this joy out of my imagination. It is full of gold lame, peacock feathers, even toy cars, vroom vroom. <laughs> Yes, here's to vroom vroom. <laughs> I, I just love this this collection, uh, this listing of disparate things all woven together so expertly. Um, Arc magazine referred to uh, to Chris's writing as deft, deft linguistic choreography, and I think that's a, a great way to describe uh, Chris's work. Leanne. Okay. Well. I guess further uh, along on the, the theme of midlife and what might concern us, preoccupy us, uh, memory loss uh, several times a day sometimes. <laughs> um, yesterday on the bus, I, I saw uh, something about, um, you know, just the importance of, of keeping neurodiversity, not labeling people and, you know, and, and so on. And, and, and I thought of, about this poem, uh, an experience of, rethinking what memory could be and uh, maybe helping me to dispel some of the, the concerns around what, what changes in, as, as we get older. It's called Sunday Picnics for Pam Sherwin. At one end of our street, tangled branches of cedar, arbutus, honey locust, thrust above the wire fence of Acacia Manor that keeps its inhabitants safe from the perils of forgetting or remembering. On this same street, your days are still spent in this small kitchen, a husband's loyal ministrations, afternoon tea, and blackberry crisp. When a name or word tumbles off the shelves of recall, you throw back your head and laugh. Tell me again of your childhood in Wiltshire Shire County, Sunday picnics lying on fallen megaliths, sun-heated sarsen at Stonehenge. Impossible to know beyond the eclipse of centuries what was worshipped there, 
With no concern for misplaced bric-a-brac of memory, you recollect giants, their lichen-dappled heads rising up into outspread sky dotted with blackbirds. After this whirl of words, what occupies your silence? Perhaps a still warm imprint on your back. You listen to what archaeologists, doctors, even a husband cannot hear. Ancient whispers in stone. And I'll read the uh, first poem in this collection. It's called Tuesday's Child. It's about the stories that we get told about the day of our birth. And... Uh, I've always been fascinated about uh, by poems about um, when when poets write about their conception or or the the day of their birth. So this is one of them, <laughs> and it's Tuesday's child. I don't know if people are familiar with that childhood rhyme. Monday's child is fair of face. Tuesday's child is full of grace, etc. Till you get to poor what whatever Wednesday's child having far to go. But <laughs> I grew up with this, yes, I, and uh, so I was a Tuesday's child, full of grace, which totally um, contradicted to the, the stories I was told about my birthday and and so on. Okay, Tuesday's child. The nurse's hands, were they warm? Or cold clamps of a vice grip exacting pressure as she placed me on the white metal scale? They were not my mother's hands. My mother still shackled after the thrashing, the amnesia drug, a mix of morphine and scopolamine. It's unlikely she smiled when the obstetrician, a little more Marcus Welby than Dr. Kildare, with a brisk grin, told her, you have a little girl, Mrs. Boschman. My mother slept off the drugs for days, reminded me for the rest of her life how god-awful the whole thing was. Gleaming placenta tree in a metal waste bin, and in the small industrial crib below the gauze sky, a fluorescent lit ceiling, I lay until my father arrived. Slapped on the back too after the news reached him at a track meet, congratulations coach, echoing behind him as he ran to his car. He gasped at the sight of my forceps bruised, misshapen skull. So the nurse reassured him that baby's heads are malleable, will mend and be right again. But when she held me out, said, here's your daughter, my fleet-footed father stumbled backwards, blurted, are you sure? He loved to tell that story each year on my birthday, and I still hear it. But now I listen in for the crinkle of small ice petal puddles breaking, the rustle of newly knitted limbs under starch sheets and birds flying back, navigating by stars, by waves, by the magnetic field of earth, the smell of earth opening, I look for green rosaries of cottonwood seeds and pussy willows in prairie twilight sleep of early April. I begin to hear the budding benediction of that day. Beautifully, beautifully read, Leanne. I love your family poems, they're great. So I was looking at the three books and seeing if there were some, some themes, and it looks like all three of you did bring in, integrate the pandemic uh, to some extent into the poem, poems uh, or um, the climate crisis. So I was wondering if, um, Chris, could you talk a little bit about the pandemic and climate crisis being integrated into the poems? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think, you know, partly the reason for that is you know, my own anxiety about the climate crisis and, uh, and about the pandemic, certainly early on in the pandemic. Um, and I, for me, anxiety is the fuel which really drives my poetry. Um, I think R.R. Ammons talked about that in a, a book of essays to the American poet saying that anxiety was uh, what drove his his poetry. So yeah, it was just natural for it to enter into my poems. Uh, I didn't want to write so much a pandemic book, but again, it, it, it's something that if it's on my mind, I'm going to collage it. It's going to add into come into my poems in some way, in some form. But you're right. Uh, you know, the climate 
the climate crisis is another thing that it's a triggering subject for me right now, at least that, that, uh, you know, it enters many of my poems. Yes. Yes. Um, I'll address the pandemic portion of it um, more than the climate change portion, um, which I am actually the latter of which is um, becoming more of a theme in a current manuscript I'm working on. But I think those of us who were part way through manuscripts when the pandemic struck, really didn't know what to do about it in terms of was it going to take over our manuscripts the way it had taken over everyone's lives? Um, do we just ignore it and continue blithely on, you know, the, the direction we were going with, with the work we were doing? So, I mean, that, that was a real puzzle, or do we find a place for it somehow? Um, and of course, I mean, how many millions of words have already been written about it, um, you know, and, you know, how much thought has already been put into it? How do you write something fresh, right, and um, and properly reflective instead of just sort of reactionary, right, or journalistic? Um, so, yeah, I certainly I wrestled with that, and I think a number of other writers did for, for some time, not knowing whether to let our work be swallowed by it as a theme or to have it find its place. And so it, it, there were like, what, two or three poems. I did find that um, there was a theme of kind of apocalypse yes. in a section of the book, um, both apocalypse and post-apocalypse, that ended up sort of finding a kind of direction as a result of the pandemic. But that theme was already there prior to the pandemic. Once I could fit those pandemic poems in there, then it sort of, it gave it a different shape and a different depth. So um, I think again, with climate change and so forth, I mean, we all kind of feel like there is an element of apocalypse in our lives all the time. And um, it's trying to find words for that. Yeah, I, I, I purposefully was choosing not to read a pandemic poem today as well, though as yeah, I, I certainly get the sense that people are needing a break. We're going into the fall. We don't know what's going to happen and so on. But uh, I guess for me, I was able to 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 fit it in. Um, you're talking about, how, you know, wh what place is it going to have? Is it going to take over? But but for me, it was in the, the, the theme of grief, with, which is one of the themes. And... Um, you know, at the crux, grief. You know, um, over, about the the the, the uh, climate change, about the pandemic. Those are interconnected, right? Uh, issues for sure, and navigating how to 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 really journey through that grief. Uh, I guess I was asking myself, am I going to be paralyzed by this? You know, am I going to shut down? And yet there really needed to be, I felt, an outpouring from myself um, as a poet with words and just the emotions for what was being lost because it was just aware of that. I remember watching the CBC News and they had a special for a while uh, feature uh, just profiling people who, who had died in the pandemic and their families talking about them, honoring them. And every night I felt like I'd had this personal loss you know these were fellow citizens world citizens lost to the pandemic so I think that's for me where it where it came into my manuscript was thinking about the losses the the grief and and how to to yeah to, to work through that to to process that to move on from it to to honor whatever we had learned and yeah another theme I found was this evocation of place that uh, is done so um, deftly by all three of you. And Evelyn, of course, there's many different places, uh, Palm uh, Springs and Bermuda, Maui, and, and even just a, a cocktail party, like in the first poem you read. Um, can you talk about the role of place um, as a source of inspiration? Um, I've always admired writers who um, were able to treat place in prose as almost like a character. Mm. And I never, when way back when I did write prose, I never was really able to do that. Um, I liked grounding my stories or not grounding them in a, in a sort of placelessness because I wanted it to be sort of a, 
kind of often they were in hotel rooms or something, but the city beyond could have been any city, you know, so I liked kind of creating that kind of moody sort of floating world. Whereas in poetry, perhaps I, I am more interested in specific place. And I've always, you know, for so long, it was never, and even now, it's not fashionable to say that you are, um, I don't know, I always felt like I was kind of an American at heart. I was like, you know, people are trying to like flee from America, right? But there was always, I've always been fascinated by Americana and America as a concept, you know, the, the troubled country that it is. And so um, many of my poems do engage with the kind of, you know, American versus Canadian without necessarily being that explicit about it. You know, two different ways of being. It has a, a filmic kind of feel to it um, with some of the characters, the waitresses, um, the plants, the flowers, the buildings, um, just really very powerfully evokes these very interesting places that I've never been to, but I can clearly imagine. And you too, Leanne, have a number of um, nature-based poems. Well, I, I live on Vancouver Island in, in such an amazingly, you know, pristine in some ways still. I, I get to swim in the Coke Sila River in the summer and, yeah, I, almost swimming with a bear inadvertently this summer, you know. Wow. <laughs> but that, so it's, yeah, it's inevitable, I think, that that, that, that will come into the work. Um, I'm thinking in, in this collection that place too is the more emblematic of what's happening in in the world like the the title that the that um the poem the, uh, the title of the book that at the crux that the poem that that you know is taken from a poem that is looking at you know drought and climate change uh exploring that and um, the experience of being a student um reading American novels like The Grapes of Wrath and having a sense of, of that, being in that place of, of desperate change for the worst and, and crisis in, 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 you know, the, in the drought belt. And now again, I, I, we happened to be traveling last November through the store, the storm. And um, so place, I, I think, in this book is very much about... Um, the site of 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 climate crisis and where it could all go really wrong if we, yeah and and trying to attend to that and be conscious of 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 the exigencies what you know what has to happen to avert this um, thank you and chris did you have any comments about place i think you had a poem about montreal set in montreal that i i, I could oh yes montreal. yeah Okay, well, certainly my first three books, I would say the dominant feature of those books was was place, you know, the sort of narrative voice that was coming through me at the time was all about southwestern Ontario, uh, small towns, my father, of course, was a OPP police officer. And so we grew up in many, many small, small towns across Ontario. Um, and then uh, you know, my voice changed. Uh, I, I feel like it became less about place and more about voice itself. Um, but in the new book, there is this wonderful poem. Uh, I, I really like it called Edward Gorey about, uh, you know, being in Montreal and being a grad student and, uh, you know, going up, um, you know, the streets on uh, St. Urban, you know, the iron staircases and going to a grad party. And I'm really, really, really miss uh, those moments, you know, but you can touch them in a poem. And that's what's so wonderful about poetry. You know, I miss those people. I haven't seen some of those people in 30 years now. And, uh, and we were all very, you know, young, incipient writers and, um, just waiting to, you know, make our mark on the world. And, and, you know, it's just, uh, it's a wonderful thing to, to be able to touch that even momentarily in a poem. Yes. Yes, indeed. Now we're running a little bit uh, short on time. I want to give some time to anyone in the audience uh, who might have a question for one or all of the authors. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Quick question, Evelyn. Uh, you talked about American. Uh, 
Okay, I'll just repeat the question. Oh. We had a question about uh, Canadiana uh, and Evelyn's comments on that versus Americana. How interesting. You know, I'm already regretting my comment about saying that I felt American at heart because I must, I must amend that by saying how, you know, in the last, oh, I don't know, at least decade, I've been probably every day, I've been so thankful I'm Canadian instead of uh, uh, down south. But I think it's very difficult for me to see because because I'm here, you know how it's like when you are not in a place, but you can observe it much more sharply than when you are inside it. Um, hmm. No, I don't regard, I mean, what do we think of as Canadian? Like Tim Hortons or, you know, beaver tails or something, right? Um, it doesn't quite have the same, I don't know. Um, maybe there's kind of a, a Hollywood sort of faded glamour that I was trying to capture too, and so or a Californian. I'm always interested in California as being like a place of the mind and the imagination as opposed to the actual physical place, right? So I think that was maybe more what I was trying to capture. Um, I don't, I feel an immense gratitude for Canada. I don't think I see it with the same kind of, um, I don't have the same mix of, what would I call it? Both a kind of, you know, almost like a romantic love and yearning that I do for Americana, as well as a, a sarcasm that I feel about, you know, um, everything that is dysfunctional in the States. I don't seem to have that eye, same eye turned towards Canada in the same way. Well, I think the outsider's eye, right? Yeah, Coming maybe. from the outside of the States, we understand the States. I've heard writers say that they can write about the States more when they're, even if they're American, outside, when they're um, expats. I guess America is so much more of a caricature than <laughs> Canada is, right? Well, there's caricatures yeah. about Canada too, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I think you do America very, very well, mm. the whole Miami and Florida, et cetera, very well. Mm. Any questions for the other writers that, uh, as well? Yes. Uh, my question is for Chris, but I think it could be picked up by Jim as well, which is just because I know Chris is writing this is so, there's quite a stark difference between what he was doing in his first three or four books and what he was doing in his last three or four books. And I was curious about that time in between those two phases. You know, when, when that feeling that that first way of writing was kind of, not maybe not coming to an end, but you were kind of done doing it, and this new thing was starting. I was just curious if Chris would talk about that experience. Of, Yes. I'll just repeat the question for the recording here. Um, Rob was asking about the different phases of writing and the in-between and the experience and the shift. Uh, if Chris could talk about that. Well, it was terrifying, of course. You know, you hone this voice uh, that you've worked really hard on for many, many, many years. Uh, you know, I wrote my third book. I was really happy with it. It's exactly the book that I wanted to write. Uh, very narrative, um, you know, very inspired by people like Philip Levine and Larry Levis, those American poets from California. Um, but then, you know, life, get, you, you get older and, you know, I, I was going through a separation. Um, you know, I had to give up drinking. Uh, you know, I had to deal with that. Uh, you know, I wasn't there were a lot of things going on. And then this other new voice started to intrude. But, uh, you know, I think from t it, my first, last, I wrote my third book in 2009 and my next book didn't come out, I don't think till 2016, 2017. So it was a long process. But once I did find this sort of new voice, I just uh, sort of surrendered to it and, uh, and, and held on tight. Um, I think that's what you have to do. You know, once you give up drinking, you, all your fears sort of fade into the background and, and you just sort of decide to live a little more honestly. And uh, I think the writing is hopefully captures that too. So thank you very much for that answer, Chris. And we've run out of time, um, but you can feel free to approach the writers, uh, and have them sign your books, uh, ask them more questions. Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming to listen to these amazing, talented 
highly skilled, experienced poets. Um, you're welcome to purchase a copy of the books uh, to, you've heard today at the official bookseller, mm -hmm. Iron Dog Books, um, and then head to the book signing table. Thank you to the staff and volunteers at Word Vancouver uh, for Jay on the tech here. Um, there are not plenty more events happening. <laughs> We're at the end of the day. Um, but uh, thank you for participating in this wonderful festival and for your attention and your, um, your generous words. Thank you for the call. Thank you.